When Neil Armstrong first stepped on the moon in July 1969, it was not merely the end of a quarter million mile trip or the winning of a political challenge, but was instead the culmination of the efforts of hundreds of thousands of Americans working to create a brand new technology. Between 1969 and 1972, America's Apollo space program successfully sent six two-man crews to explore the lunar surface. The exploits of these 12 rather common-looking men captured the attention and imagination of the entire world. These are the uncommon stories of the members of a most elite fraternity, the Fraternity of Moonwalkers. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. I don't think we realized at the time, you know, how absurd and ridiculous it was. It was a crazy goal. I mean, like, it was a lunatic thing to do. And I think all the people that were involved with doing it knew it was a lunatic thing to do. I mean, they were landing on the moon seven years after Kennedy said, get started. And that's a lot to achieve in seven years. We were struggling mightily to, to figure out how to use these, the Atlas rocket and the spacecraft and so on and to accomplish this relatively modest goal of getting a man in Earth orbit. Uh, somewhat unbeknownst to me, the discussions were going on about the, the going to the moon. And when I heard that announced, I mean, it was like a, it was like a major shock to me because the challenges that we had in putting this little 2,000 2,000 pound capsule into Earth orbit were plenty big enough. I believe this was probably the, the most dangerous uh, period of uh, space flight because the uh, spaceships that we were flying were not particularly reliable. The technology was, uh, was very primitive at that period of time. But we had the guts and the courage and the belief that uh, this quest uh, that uh, the search in space, this, this process of discovering this new environment, uh, was worth this risk. When we chose astronauts, uh, we wanted people who were willing to uh, subject themselves to the rigors of flying in space as well as the dangers of flying in space. And so it was our feeling that the people that could do that job satisfactorily were test pilots. They, they were used to flying in high-performance machines daily, used to putting their lives on the line, used to making decisions when their lives were on the line. When we flew Mercury, we had four manned orbital flights, Mercury 6, 7, 8, and 9. The Gemini program, the two-man vehicle that we built and flew in the early 60s, mid-60s, was a tremendous comp contribution to the space program uh, because it added so much to our competence and experience with uh, operational kind of things uh, in uh, space flight. One of the things that they did was that they took bigger risks than they take now, you know. Um, every one of those flights was a risk. You know, after Apollo 1, they lost three people in Apollo 1, you know, I mean, and, and they still fixed it and they were flying to the moon a year and a half later. But we would not have been able to get on with the lunar program that aggressively, and as we did then to Apollo 11 six months later, if we didn't have a great big body of experience in the middle and that built the confidence in the team and the hardware that the Gemini program provided. The Saturn V rocket that would take three astronauts to the moon was by far the most complex piece of machinery ever built. It was over 400 feet tall, weighed over six and a half million pounds, and had over six million parts in it. The command module, located on top of this rocket, 
was where the three-man crew stayed during their journey to and from the moon. The fragile-looking lunar module was designed to take two of the astronauts to the lunar surface, while the third astronaut remained in lunar orbit in the command module. Even if the rocket functioned at 99.99% efficiency, up to 600 parts could potentially fail, resulting in the loss of the mission and crew. Every part in it was built by the low bidder, you know? So, I mean, when you're sitting on top of the thing, I mean, like, you, you know better than anybody else how complicated it is, how many moving parts there are in it, you know? I mean, the wiring in the thing could wire a small city. And every inch of it is full of exploding fuel. You know, I mean, it's equivalent to sitting on top of an H-bomb or an A-bomb. I mean, or, or enough of a bomb to, to where you don't care what kind of bomb it is. I mean, you're gone if it doesn't work right. But here we are, spent all our lives in a, in a risk environment. Uh, you acknowledge that fact going in, and you, you don't dwell on it. You don't let it, let it bother you. Uh, if the damn thing blows up, you're going to be dead. Uh, that's, that's the least of the consequence. I'd rather do that than get smashed up and spend the rest of my life as an invalid. It was the ultimate experience as a test pilot, uh, the ultimate flight. I don't care how many times you've flown uh, uh, or what you've flown, this was going to be the, the ultimate trip. And uh, turned out that way for me. These test pilot astronauts spent all of their lives learning how to fly, learning to be pilots, be at the controls. On launch day, all they could do was strap in and ride the rocket like passengers on a bus. So it was a very nervous time for them. Well, every launch uh, day is uh, a time of uh, excitement, enthusiasm, and apprehension. But I think uh, in most circumstances, uh, you always feel that the chances of actually lifting off are, <laughs> are fairly distant or remote, and uh, you have to temper your enthusiasm, enthusiasm with the realization that, uh, in fact, you may be coming back in and trying to do another day. The heart rates that they monitored in mission control, I mean, like, almost invariably showed higher heart rates during launch than in any other portion of the flight, including when they would land on the moon. Because when they're landing, they're driving them. You know, when they're blasting off, they're just sitting there. And they were as scared as they ever got. And I can recall the uh, fellow in the house of the, uh, in the uh, mission control was counting down 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. Seven, six. Now, he said that, but still, his engines are 360 feet away, so I didn't feel anything. And uh, four, three. When he said three, then I began to feel a shaking and a rattling. And when I was observing, as I observed the uh, shaking and rattling, uh, it, uh, it was more than I imagined. It was more than I thought was safe. And I can recall thinking... Uh, maybe this is going to come apart. Maybe this is shaking more than it should, certainly more than any airplane I'd ever been on. Just was tremendous vibration. And as this ran through my head, I hear him say, one liftoff. People said that when that vehicle left the ground, it shook so much that the ground vibrated. You couldn't prove it by me. I was sitting in the top of it. I think my knees were shaken, but there again it was vibrating so much you couldn't tell. And I remember the vehicle really started to shake from side to side. It was just a slow acceleration as it lifted off and took 10, 11 seconds to clear the tower. And I thought they'd never say tower clear. Uh, and the whole time it was shaking like crazy. I thought there was something wrong with it. I didn't know whether it was going to uh, get... Uh, uh, go in orbit or not, but uh, John was real cool and he said we'll go and uh, sure enough, uh, we went, uh, shaking like crazy during the whole first stage. That was the first time human beings left the Earth. And historically, I think that's the way history's gonna look back at these flights. 
is not that they landed on the moon, but that they left the Earth. I remember looking at the window saying, I hope that doesn't break. You know, still you can see through it. I'm going to die. That's a feeling that I haven't had much in my life. The death was five inches away. We looked out the window, and the earth was in our window just like that in the blue, in the black, black ground, and it started to get flat. You no longer saw it in three dimensions. It's about that time when you're going to the moon. I personally and the other fellows that were with me we started to wonder if we hadn't bitten off more than we could chew. They weren't looking at the moon on the way out there. They were looking back over their shoulder at home as it got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you go around and you talk to them all, they'll talk to you about the Earth more than the moon, more than anything else. I mean, they'll talk poetry about what the Earth looks like. And I remember looking back at the Earth and seeing it go, first it goes away very fast, almost like the fastest elevator. And it's big and it's starting to get small, but it's going away. And you're thinking, boy, everybody's going away that I've ever known. They're going that way, and the three of us are going this way. And it kind of is, is shocking. And I can remember looking at the Earth when it got about that big then and thinking, you know, everybody I've ever known. They're all back there, and here we are. There's billions back there who we are here, and it's kind of scary, but, it's a, but I wanted to be there, but still kind of frightening. The Earth, as it appears from the moon, uh, is a very uh, small and fragile object. Uh, and when you think about it, that's not an inaccurate description. Uh, certainly a lot of the uh, things that we do down here uh, can affect the... Uh, the balance in a very uh, fragile way. The, uh, the uh, greenhouse effect we're noticing today, for example, uh, the, the changes uh, between a healthy atmosphere and an unhealthy atmosphere are, are very subtle, very, very fragile, and uh, you sort of get that feeling when you look at the, uh, at the Earth from a great distance. The first landing on the moon by Apollo 11 proved to be much more difficult than anyone had ever anticipated. There were concerns as to whether or not the lunar module would perform up to expectations, and if Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin would even survive the landing. And this room that we're in becomes uh, alive. As soon as you, you can hear the noise, the hum in the background as people are talking, but it's when you put your headset on and plug into the console, all of a sudden, you know, these many loops, many people talking simultaneously. And there now you start hearing crispness. I mean, boy, crisp clarity, decisions. I mean, uh, people are communicating there right on top of the job, and all of a sudden it starts to sink in on you that, hey, today's the day. The uh, flight director, Gene Krantz, come on the, uh, come on the intercom, and he gave us a speech that I think General Patton would have been proud of. He said, folks, we're here. We are going to succeed. You've been trained. You know what to do and we're going to go do it. But then he said something was even better. He said, but no matter how it turns out, I'm going to be with you. And no matter what you do, I'm going to be right behind you. And you can't imagine what that meant to a bunch of young fellows who, like myself, were only 25 or 26 years old. Okay, let's go there, Captain. I'm on a hot fire. Okay, I'll fly controllers going around the horn. Go, go for undocking. Okay, let's go. 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 Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom. Go for unlocking. Your brain's moving. Your thoughts are moving. Your thinking strategy. You're on your toes. You're ready for anything. And at this time here, I really came to the feeling, and I think this was true throughout the room, that says, hey, we're going to land on the moon today. But we didn't have time to think about that long because very shortly thereafter, we had our first of several program alarms during this period of time. A series of computer alarms at the most critical phase of landing threatened the outcome of the entire mission. 
In the hot seat was a 26-year-old flight controller, Steve Bales, who had the power to pull the plug on the world's first manned lunar landing. Still looking very good. Gear down. Twelve oh one is sounds as four little four little numbers sounds sort of ah ho hum, but what it really means is, hey bud, I had too much to do that last second. I didn't get it all done, and I hope that I've done the most important things. And it's up to you to figure out if I've done the most important things because I'm going on, I can't stop. And that's what that was all about. We'd have called an abort, but potentially loss of mission, big time loss of mission. That's the that was the concern. The good news is, training carried us through. We knew what to do. In our simulations, we're accustomed to having a large number of these kinds of difficulties. So uh, I didn't feel that this was a, an oppressive uh, situation, not that we weren't concerned about it. That last minute or so was really, really tense. Uh, and uh, it, the, the tension in mission control was so real you could cut it with a knife. And, and I'm just babbling along on these, you know, giving them updates and this and that and the other. And Deke Slayton was sitting right next to me uh, during that final few minutes. And, um, and uh, about the last minute, he hit me in the side and said, whispered, shut up, Charlie, and let them land. I had to keep talking, I had to keep working because I had a series of stay no stay decisions uh, that we had to make. Because in case the LEM spacecraft had been lam damaged during the descent or some of the temperatures possibly we got into a, a soft landing area where it started to tip off, we had to be ready to abort at any time. So I had to keep my controllers, my entire te team grinding away for what we call the T1 stay no stay decision. Hey, uh newspaper person who was a friend that uh, was also foreign and uh, I, I thought had reasonably leftist leanings and, uh, and anyhow we were having this discussion and this person was absolutely convinced that the United States government propaganda office somewhere had written these great words for Neil to say Okay, if you think that that's the case, we'll sit down here and we'll figure out what I'm going to say. So I figured I'd say something to the effect, you know, it may have been a, a little one for Neil, but it was a big one for a little fellow like me, seeing I was the shortest person in the office. I bet this person $500, which was a reasonably large sum of money in those days. Yeah, I thought that, uh, that if I could get 500 bucks off a communist, that was probably uh, pretty good. person then realized that there wasn't propagandists, but they reneged on the bet, and I never won the money. I was never paid. I think I was relieved by the ease that we had in being able to maneuver around, uh, perhaps impressed by the, the talcum powder nature of, of the fine surface itself. If you look at a boot print, it just was so smooth, uh, just like you just put your foot in, in talcum powder. On the Earth, with that, all that equipment on and a backpack, we weighed 360 pounds. 
and you could barely move your big troll. But when you're on the moon and one, you only weighed 60 pounds, so the jump was delightful. I would just feel good. It's a good feeling because everything about you is lighter, and so I felt stronger. I felt like this is a great day. You know, I can jump. Look how high I can jump. Look at how light this is. I just grab this and move it over here, and normally it's pretty heavy. So it gave me a feeling of being strong and, uh, and fast and, and uh, feeling good. It was like the best day of a life because all this strength is here, you think. We decide to do the Moon Olympic. I decide to try to set the high jump record on the moon. And as I start to do that, I bounce a couple of times, and then I fall over backwards. And as I fall over backwards, fear strikes. If I split my suit open, I'm dead. As John helps me up, I get very, very quiet as I listen to the pump and the oxygen flow in the suit. Fortunately, the suit holds, and my fear subsides. The several times that I fell down up there, usually from backing up and hitting a rock or something like that, I would fall so much slowly, more slowly on the moon than I did on the Earth, that I never was in danger of puncturing myself. If I started to fall backwards on, on Earth, I'd just go plump. But there, falling slowly without light gravity, I could usually turn around and just catch myself very easily with my hands, and then I could just push like that and push right back up. Being on the moon is, is you're unprepared for visually what everything looks like. I mean, like, there's no sense of scale or distance, you know? I mean, like, even out in the desert, you know, you see a telephone pole a half a mile away, you know? I mean, to where, like, that telephone pole cues you what your distances are. There's nothing on the moon. You know, there is no way to tell how far away anything is. I mean, everybody had an incredibly difficult time finding their way around. Later on, when they were taking the rover out there, they were getting lost, you know? I mean, like, they, they had to be very careful about where they were going. You can't tell distance or size on the surface of the moon. You have nothing relatively to, to judge uh, distance by, except the lunar module itself. And when you take that rover and you drive 15 or 20 uh, kilometers away and go over the hills and around a bend, it's very difficult to find it in the first place, much less use it to judge uh, distance or size. Shortly after the flight, somebody asked him, how did you guys navigate on the moon? And Al said, I don't know, I just followed Pete. I had a hard time finding what the right craters, just, just because I didn't lose my sense of direction, but I sure wasn't really positive which crater was which. The Earth is 230 or 40,000 miles away, and when you hold up your thumb like this, you can you can only see the blue clouds, the blue surface and the and the clouds, and you can hold up your thumb and cover up the Earth. And if that doesn't worry you, well, nothing ever will. I'm uh, in awe of what God has given us. Uh, it's uh, the beauty of Earth. Uh, of course, from space, uh, that one, that jewel of Earth, that blue and white uh, ball hanging up there, just uh, the eye is behold, can behold that beauty, and it makes it seem alive. And I do remember one time holding my hand up, and uh, and underneath my hand was the Earth, uh, and a thought passed my mind that you know underneath my hand is five billion people or four billion, whatever it was in those days. And we've all been impressed with this view of the Earth, and uh, I think uh, our lives will never be the same because we've had that rare opportunity to see the Earth from far away. It was a spiritual journey. You know, I mean, like, that's supposed to be true of every big journey of our life. There's supposed to be a spiritual journey, or there's supposed to be a spiritual component of the physical journey. And it was equally true for those men. It was true of that journey, the biggest journey humans have ever taken also had a powerful spiritual component. On the control pedestal of this little car, Dave Scott left uh, a Bible, a red leather Bible. You can just see it there on the control 
pedestal, and not too many people know that, that it's there. One of the funny things that happened during a flight, I have a twin brother named Bill, Bill and Bill's a doctor uh, in our hometown in South Carolina. Well, during the, uh, during the mission, there I am bouncing around on the moon, and my brother walks into mission control. Uh, he gets a pass, and he goes, he wants to sit on the flight, the flight uh, surgeon's console. And uh, a few people knew he was coming in, but I mean, the whole room looked over, I understand, looked at him, and they looked at the TV, and they looked at, you know, and they thought they were, what's happened here? And then all of a sudden they realized uh, uh, the word got around it was my twin brother. We're almost, we are identical. I mean, so uh, that uh, created a few stares and a few laughs in mission control. After all the scientific experiments had been performed, and after all the moon rocks had been collected, these astronauts still found time to have some fun. We're on the way up there, and I said, you know, when we get to the time we're going to have a little fun in uh, lunar gravity, I'm going to whack a couple of golf balls. And he said, geez, you tell anybody about that? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I talked to the boss, I get Ruth, and I told him that the things were all screwed up there, that uh, on the surface that I wouldn't uh, fool with it because we could be accused of being frivolous to wasting taxpayers money and so on and so uh, he said if things were not going well and I wouldn't do it but if things are going fine then I would go ahead and, and uh, hit these two golf balls. We must have gone through a library of Playboy magazines. Right. They kept clipping out Miss Playboy or the month or this, that, and the other thing, interspersing those pictures throughout the checklist. Got through those pages, and I had to turn the page again, and then wound up with the Playmate of the Month. And I and I and that one really did take me by surprise. I was not expecting that at all. And, of course, I couldn't say anything about it over the radio, so I was doing a lot of laughing, and people didn't, they weren't sure why I was laughing, but I don't think they wanted to ask why I was laughing either. So, uh, you know, the, some of the outside people thought that I was being very frivolous, and I might have even been intoxicated on the moon, but that wasn't the case at all. I was just laughing at these in-jokes, and I obviously couldn't talk about it over the year. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his... Uh, findings and on the moon and uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon and i'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time how about that that mr galileo was correct in his findings a lot of people think that we went did all this moon work in a secret movie lot in Arizona. And of course I have the gray hairs and so does Charlie Duke to prove that we were up there. Especially the old timers in South Carolina, you know, they, nah, we did it with mirrors in Arizona or something, you know. It's amazing how many people don't believe we actually went to the moon. And I tease everybody, I say, well, I don't know where they sent those other guys, but I know they sent me to the moon. <laughs> I haven't uh, read the plaque. Uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. It says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. We came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. An idea we had 
uh, before the flight to just to get the whole family involved was uh, to have a picture taken. So we had a picture taken of, uh, of our family in the backyard and I got permission uh, from NASA to let me take this picture along and leave it on the moon. They said, well, sure, no problem. So uh, on the back of this photograph of our family, uh, we wrote something to the effect of this is a fat, this is a family of astronaut Charlie Duke from planet Earth who landed on the moon in uh, April of 1972 uh, and then we left it on the moon and so I pitched it out on the moon and took a picture of the picture. The thing about the uh, the moon that I thought was peculiar was that it seemed to depend on the uh, the angle of the sun. Uh, when the sun was uh, almost overhead and it was noon down below, the uh, the moon appeared to be a, a warm and a friendly place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, near dawn or dusk, it became uh, very uh, foreboding looking. The uh, craters cast very long shadows and the place looked uh, distinctly unfriendly. So I, I was intrigued by the, the contrast uh, based purely on the uh, what angle the sun happened to be coming from. The command module pilots were the only people who were ever by themselves. You know, I mean, the other two guys would go down and land on the moon, and they were real busy all the time. They had mission control talking to them constantly. So they never had time to just kind of sit back and think about where they were. But the command module pilots, I mean, like, stayed in orbit all by themselves, half of which they were on the dark side of the moon and couldn't even talk to Earth if they wanted to. So they had plenty of time to kind of sit back and just look around and realize, wow, I'm at the moon. Well, I enjoyed being in the command module by myself. It was a, a happy little home. Uh, all the machinery was working properly. Uh, and uh, my, my concerns uh, were not within the command module, but simply that something might go wrong with the uh, lamb, with the lunar module, and these two guys might get stuck on the surface of the moon. That was my, my main concern. And we did train, or I did train to return by myself, went through all the mission activities that uh, I would have had to have operated the command module by myself as opposed to having three people. But I never concerned myself with that, I mean, I knew they were going to come back. It would have been a very, very unpleasant day if they hadn't, let me tell you. That would have been three days of pure, not terror, but real sorrow to come back alone. I don't even like to contemplate that. I don't either. <laughs> well, I'm sure you don't. No? Once the crew entered the lunar module for the last time, there were literally hundreds of things they had to do, from securing moon rocks and their gear, to checking and testing the various parts of their lunar module, ensuring its safe return to the command module. We know that there are 200 ways that the lunar module engine could fail to start. It was a pretty tense time. And the ground wasn't saying anything, and all of a sudden, I began to think, do we still have radio contact, you know, with the, with the ground? Because nobody had said anything for quite a long period. So we called him and asked him, and Pete said to me, I remember him saying, you getting a little nervous? I said, yeah. But you'll get over it. I said, you know, this is your first ride. I said, besides, Al, if it doesn't light, look at it this way. We become the first permanent monument to the U.S. space program on the moon. <laughs> I said, yeah, that makes me feel real good. <laughs> Conrad had just sort of just scratched that itch for a couple hours, you know? I mean, like, that's the way astronauts were. No one will ever forget, and of course we've been reminded over and over again, uh, 
Neil's first words on the surface of the moon. But not many people remember man's last words on the surface of the moon. We were sitting in the lunar module about 20 seconds before liftoff, and I looked over at Jack, and I said, Jack, let's get this mother out of here. I was starting to form this thought. It didn't, it didn't light. Just then, the engine lit, and it bang, it kicked us. And then from then on, it was a wild ride. We had to burn six minutes and five seconds to get into orbit. And there's no gauges, really, on your uh, ascent stage engine to see how it's doing. The idea being, if it isn't doing OK, what are you going to do about it? It was like riding a fighter plane. And uh, it was just, and it was some ride. Man, it, it, it feel this baby go. And it, that was the feeling we had then. It was just exhilaration riding this thing back in orbit. Pete uh, leaned over to me and he says, you know, Al, how would you like to fly this thing? And I thought, well, that'd be fun because I hadn't flown it up to that time. I'd just been doing my part of the job. And so as I started to put in my first thrust, I said, wait a minute, the people down in Houston at Mission Control aren't going to like this. And he said, don't worry, they're on the backside of the moon, they'll never know it. And sure enough, he thought of everything. Back in orbit, both spacecraft came together to rendezvous and after a quick inspection, the command module pilot performs the critical docking maneuvers required to link both spacecraft together. After the crew, moon rocks, and film were transferred to the command module, the lunar module was jettisoned, and the crew made their preparations for the three-day trip back home. But somehow going fast again made me feel like we were headed back home. And I think that Neil Armstrong said that the time he felt like they were going to pull off the mission is when he got in orbit. And I agree, because you're going fast again. You feel like once you're going fast, you don't have to go a little bit faster, and then you can head on home. So it was a really good feeling to, uh, to get into orbit. We're on track, and shortly after, we turned our uh, spaceship around so we could see the moon. And the moon literally just began, we were climbing so fast, the moon just literally just began to shrink just like that. And you could see it. I mean, literally, a whole satellite that big, 2,000 miles an hour, and just began to shrink like this. And that was really spectacular. Then we had to settle down for the three-day trip home. But that first uh, hour or so, was uh, we were glued to the windows <laughs> watching that. We have a perspective of the Earth as we sit here in this room. You have another perspective when you're driving down a freeway or flying an airplane on a boat. You have another perspective in Earth orbit. An additional perspective of our home planet is when your lunar distance is 240,000 miles away. This whole concept of whole Earth, that's a cliche that we all throw around now, but I mean, that's where it came from. These were the first humans to actually see the whole Earth. They took the first photographs of the whole Earth. You know what I mean? Like, they really did appreciate the whole Earth before any of the rest of us. And they brought that feeling back with them. And I think it is slowly communicated out to the rest of us. But that's the, the biggest lesson I think I learned from talking to them, is how important leaving the Earth was to them, and then, of course, coming back to it. And our trajectory was such on the way home that about 100,000 miles out, it was 100 miles that that we nipped in the line where the earth fully eclipsed the sun and we were between the earth and the moon and so what we had was an absolute full moon behind us and for the first time an eclipsed night earth so that there was no sun and and instead of seeing a black as you see in the photographs you don't see the night earth what we did see was the full night earth in moonshine, in full moonshine.
We could see the land masses. We could see thunderstorms from 100,000 miles out. We could, we could distinguish the ocean and the, and, the, and the clouds that I think we're the only ones that saw that. Coming back, the command module hits the atmosphere at essentially escape velocity, 26 to 28,000 miles an hour. It comes in just like a meteor, and the gases ionize around it to where the crew is cut off from radio communications. Normally, it's about three minutes. You're always worried about the parachutes on, on the command module, where we had one flight where only one, of, only two of the three uh, worked, and uh, so the rate of descent was higher. So you're always concerned about that part of the mission. We were coming down very fast wondering would the spacecraft survive the impact would we survive the impact a lot of thoughts racing through our mind we really couldn't communicate i was responsible for reading the checklist and i had difficulty reading the checklist because the helicopter crew that was circling us kept saying fellows don't worry about it you're going to be all right but they kept repeating themselves so much i really wondered if they knew what they were talking about so we were coming down on two shoots and a prayer but Finally, we hit the water and we did survive and Apollo 15 was home. One of my jobs, sitting in the right-hand seat with a little window in front of me, was to take a 16-millimeter camera and mount it in the window. After the main chutes came out, take and dismount the camera and set it uh, in a bag next to my seat. During the entry, uh, everything went as planned, uh, but somehow I got behind the checklist and when it came time to dismount the camera, for some reason, I decided not to take it off the bracket and put it in the bag. When we hit the water, that camera and bracket came off the mount, which I didn't know it would do, but it such a hit, and it hit me right here. In fact, uh, I, off, I thought that if, if that thing had hit me in the middle of the head, it might have killed me because it really came off there. And fortunately, it hit me a glancing blow, and apparently it knocked me a little unconscious. It was luck. Because I think if I'd had a little bad luck, I could have gotten killed right there just because I didn't follow the checklist. More than the moon rocks and more than Tang and more than these things that we learned and that we've built, you know, I mean, because I think that it did expand our awareness and our understanding of who we are and our role in the universe. I mean, like, what does this beautiful blue-green globe have to do with all the rest of it? You know, I mean, and, and we know more about our role in the universe because of those flights. But you tend to see uh, mankind as, as one and as a, uh, a common thread going through it because we're all on that little ball. And when you just to the, just the distance to the moon puts you on a little ball that uh, uh, all of us that is uh, sort of insignificant. And yet there are three billion of us and we've got to learn how to get along on this, this earth. And uh, I think that perspective of of mankind, the uniqueness of the, of the oneness of mankind is uh, probably the most significant thing I've, I've gotten from the flight over the long term. You know, we got to uh, learn to uh, love one another and get along and then we can solve our problems uh, through uh, man's technology. And sure, we have a lot of problems here on Earth and sure they need to be solved, but they're not going to be solved by uh, by not expanding our knowledge and that's what uh, space exploration is all about expanding human knowledge is just fundamentally critical for people right now we're at the stage in the in the in, in human civilization where uh, if we don't use our brains we're probably not going to make it we're not going to be able to make it with our muscles anymore we have to think about these things we have to go out there find new knowledge look at that new knowledge and apply it to solving the problems of tomorrow it was certainly one of the great adventures of, of our generation, and it's the sort of thing that, that uh, people in the future are going to be doing. Many of the youngsters alive on the Earth today will get their chance to go into space, either to the moon or to Mars, and certainly their kids and their grandkids are going to go. So maybe they'll be curious to see how it was done. I hope that Apollo brought new light to the people of the Earth. So that indeed we can regard the earth differently, we can regard ourselves differently. And we have been enriched by that experience. Some of them speak to you very eloquently. You know, I think the way they talk about the earth is a big part of that. You know, I mean, to where like the earth became a personality and a character and a living thing for all of these men instead of just this abstract place where we all live. 
And, uh, and that was great, you know? I mean, I think that, to me, validates the adventure or the journey. We brought back a belief in American craftsmanship at this period of time because it was an American flag that was planted in the moon. It was American craftsmanship that got there. So we brought back a sense of wonder and mystery. It was probably one of the expansionist periods for science and technology. Kids wanted to become astronauts. Everybody wanted to see them. They brought back this resurgence, this interest, this vitality that has always been American. The war that we really must solve if we're going to be successful in the next century is a war that nobody knows we're in, and that's a war on ignorance. If we solve that war, we can whip all the other uh, things in the process. That's what space exploration is all about, expanding our knowledge of what's going on around us. And, uh, boy, it's in its infancy, uh, and I think it's important to do it now because... Uh, I don't know how much time we've got, the human race does. We need to get smarter and we need to learn better how to control our destinies. And I think uh, space exploration is a key, a key to that. I don't see exploring space as ignoring earthly problems so much as it's a, it's a different way to grow. You know, we have to grow our way out of our problems. And that's a very serious way to grow. You know, you learn a lot doing it. You learn a lot about yourself doing it. You learn a lot about the planet you just left, you know, and, uh, and I think that's important. It can all be useful to the growing experience of the human race. But what I think ought to be really important in the way we think about these flights is to realize that going to the moon wasn't the important part. That's just the first place you can stop. What really matters about Apollo is those were the first people to leave the Earth to go anywhere, you know, in the next 500 years, if we don't destroy ourselves, who knows where we'll go? You know, I mean, there's a whole universe out there waiting for us. The astronauts who left the Earth and walked on the moon are considered the greatest of all explorers and adventurers. They risk everything in the search for answers about the origin of our solar system, and their efforts were the fulfillment of a dream as old as humanity. When Gene Cernan last stepped off the lunar surface in December 1972, it marked the end of the golden era of lunar exploration. Like all other pioneering explorers, these men have led the way for future astronauts and lunar colonists who will once again take those same risks and leave the Earth on a continuing quest for the secrets of the universe.
these the Atlas rocket and the spacecraft and so on, and to accomplish this relatively modest goal of getting a man in Earth orbit. Uh, somewhat unbeknownst to me, the discussions were going on about the, the going to the moon. And when I heard that announced, I mean, it was like a, it was like a major shock to me because the challenges that we had in putting this little 2,000 two thousand pound capsule into Earth orbit were plenty big enough. I believe this was probably the, the most dangerous uh, period of uh, space flight because the uh, spaceships that we were flying were not particularly reliable. The technology was, uh, was very primitive at that period of time, but we had the guts and the courage and the belief that uh, this quest uh, that uh, the search in space, this, this process of discovering this new environment, uh, was worth this risk. When we chose astronauts, When Neil, uh, we wanted people who were willing to uh, subject themselves to the rigors of flying in space, as well as the dangers of flying in space. And so it was our feeling that the people that could do that job satisfactorily were test pilots. They they were used to flying in high-performance machines daily, used to putting their lives on the line, used to making decisions when their lives were on the line. When we flew Mercury, we had four manned orbital flights, Mercury 6, 7, 8, 9. The Gemini program, the two-man vehicle that we built and flew in the early 60s, mid-60s, was a tremendous comp contribution to the space program uh, because it added so much to our competence and experience with uh, operational kind of things uh, in uh, space flight. One of the things that they did was that they took bigger risks than they take now, you know. Um, every one of those flights was a... We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. I don't think we realized at the time, you know, how absurd and ridiculous it was. It was a crazy goal. I mean, like it was a lunatic thing to do. And I think all the people that were involved with doing it knew it was a lunatic thing to do. I mean, they were landing on the moon seven years after Kennedy said, get started. And that's a lot to achieve in seven years. We were struggling mightily to, to figure out how to use Armstrong first stepped on the moon in July 1969. It was not merely the end of a quarter million mile trip or the winning of a political challenge but was instead the culmination of the efforts of hundreds of thousands of Americans working to create a brand new technology. Between 1969 and 1972, America's Apollo space program successfully sent six two-man crews to explore the lunar surface. The exploits of these 12 rather common-looking men captured the attention and imagination of the entire world. These are the uncommon stories of the members of a most elite fraternity, the Fraternity of Moonwalkers. 